It is a truly pleasure for me to introduce Stephanie and Angeli. Uh, we met in the Hamburg um, Artificial Intelligence Meetup, and they told me they met in the master at the University of Hamburg. The master is called Intelligence Adaptive Systems. I post the two links in the chat. So pretty cool stuff. And yeah, the room is yours, please, please. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. I'll just share uh, my slides. Steffi, you're right. Great. So yeah, first of all, um, I hope you're all doing well. We had that first question that we actually didn't really touch upon in the um, in the uh, getting to know each other, which was um, how was 2021, uh, and I hope it's it's okay, and I hope that today you have a good day. And um, yeah, thank you to the organizers um, for organizing this event and for having us here. And thank you for everyone else for your interest in our um, talk. And yeah, I hope that um, you enjoy it. And so the title is From RGBD Images to Complete Point Clouds. That's kind of, it's quite a lot. And let's see what is behind that title. So first of all, who are we? Uh, I hope that you see both of us here in the grid on the side. So I'm Anjali and Steffi is there. She's waiting. <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah, we're both from that course that as Maria um, introduced, which is called uh, Intelligent Adaptive Systems at University of Hamburg. And it's kind of a fancy name for another fa fancy um, term, which is artificial intelligence and also robotics, uh, but mainly the software side of robotics. And I also co-founded a company last year with two other of my friends, and um, it's called Adalab, and you can find us online um, under adalab.ai, and we do consulting for ML and AI, and we're starting out, but yeah, we're having fun, so check us out if you're interested. And you can find me on Twitter, there's my handle, you can find me on LinkedIn if you want to get in touch, I'm kind of active there. Yeah, and then Steffi, please say something about yourself. Yeah, uh, I'm studying at the same course, I'm just about to start my master thesis, and hopefully we'll talk about that at some point soon as well. Um, you can also find me on Twitter at qbird underscore, and um, also I wrote some Medium articles. Um, I will tell you a little bit about that later and uh, get a link on there as well, and you can find me on GitHub as well, where I'm fairly active. Thank you. Okay, let's get to it. So hands, this is what it's about tonight. It's about grasping. So we're going to kind of set the tone with a little um, task that we prepared because um, most of the time as we as humans are grasping things, we're not really considering it con consciously. And this is why I want to kind of prime you. Um, and I would like to ask you to look around where you're sitting and um, look whether or not there are any objects close to you. Um, and um, they should be of a size that is graspable with one, or it could be two hands, but something that you can easily grasp. Exactly. And then as Maria is already trying to do, she's, I would like to ask you to actually grasp it. Just take the object. Nice. And then put it back or put it in front of you. And then I want to ask you to do it once again, but this time, think about it. Take your time, consider all the subtasks basically that go into grasping the object and think about the information that you're processing. Um, what are you noticing about the object? What is going through your mind as you're shaping your hands and anticipating the grasp and planning it? Nice, nicely done, Maria. <laughs> okay. Nice. So as you might notice, um, there's actually a lot of information that goes into, into grasping, right? So you're, as you're focusing on your object, you're considering its shape. You already, you already know kind of what dimensions. Is it really tiny? Is it, is it a large object? You also have some knowledge about how the object is shaped in areas that you don't even see from where you're sitting because it's actually in the back, right? But you're considering all of these different informations, weight, surface structure, and so on and so forth. You, you get the idea. And so let's look at how it looks like when a robot grasps something. 
we have a little video that we actually just borrowed from YouTube. And um, just have a look at the actuators, the hands of the robot. It has these like two hooks with joints. And then its head, you can see in the middle down there, it has two cameras and it's moving quite slowly because it's processing all the information, right? And so, yeah, so we have some two stills from that video. So if you notice the first picture up there, um, the robot is interacting with a very cluttered environment, right? So this refrigerator, thank you, Chef, <laughs> for pointing. Um, the refrigerator has all these different objects and um, the owner probably asked the robot to, to find the Gatorade bottle and um, the robot is approaching it using its uh, RGB camera that it's equipped with to segment out the, um, the shape. And then it also has some um, knowledge about how far away it is, right? So it has some depth information there too. It's probably equipped with some kind of depth sensor, could be an infrared sensor. And um, it has a kind of some understanding of, the, of some of the three dimensional information in that area there. But what it doesn't know is how the object looks like from the back, right? It doesn't have a 360 degree representation of that object. However, that could be very useful information for shaping the hand and anticipating the grasp. And so this is kind of what we what motivated our project. So yeah, as I described to you, the hands of that robot specifically were kind of simple, let's say. It had two fingers with a joint each, so not many degrees of freedom, so I call it. So this is another example how a robotic hand could look like. It has three fingers, many joints. It has these um, little black tips of the fingers, these domes. It's actually some kind of rubber texture. And behind that is a tactile sensor. And so uh, Steffi and I, we worked on another project, I think a year before the one that we're talking about today. And there we um, uh, classified whether or not the object in the hand of that robot is slipping. So we have this little bottle there, just uh, some hair conditioner, we cut it open. And then in one setting, we had it empty. And then the other one, we used those screw nuts, that's the English word, um, to have weight in it. And then you get a time, time series of um, whether or not there's yeah, um, this friction going through. So this is just to show you another example of another problem that goes into robotic manipulation and grasping. Okay. And now um, to today's lesson. So what are we going to actually teach you or convey to you? Um, I actually like the term impulse <laughs> that a friend who was also here uh, likes to use. So um, the first impulse was um, problems that go into robotic grasping. So we're actually unfortunately not going to talk much more about robots themselves, um, but um, we kind of try to explain how the robotic um, problem set motivates our project, which in itself is actually more the software side of things. So we're using deep neural networks to um, deal with that information that I ta um, to talked about earlier, the one that the, the information that is um, collected through the robotic head and the eyes and the depth sensors to uh, create these three-dimensional complete representations of that, for example, Gatorade bottle. And also we're going to touch upon uh, the topic of working with scientific, scientific code repositories as open source is kind of a big thing and something that we want to support and um, bring forward. Um, uh, yeah, we were just briefly going to talk about a bit about the experience that we had with specifically scientific code repositories. So this is what we did. This is a overview. I know it's kind of a lot of information on there, trying to lead you through it. Um, so it, what, we're, what we did in the project was we tried to create a full pipeline, uh, which we built up on upon two networks in order to um, take this RGB image of a cluttered environment 
which here is um, this data that we use is from the YCB video data set, uh, which has just a lot of these photos with different household objects and cluttered scenes. And um, uh, yeah, we took these RGB images and then used the segmentation network to extract a certain target object that we specified um, earlier. Um, and, and then we took the depth map corresponding to it to get a preliminary representation that is incomplete and also very noisy, as you can see here. We can barely understand that this could be a scissor or a pair of scissors. And then we took another network to create a completed three-dimensional uh, representation that if you would ro rotate that, it would have a, the complete surface shape from all perspectives. And yeah, so the first task was the task of semantic segmentation. And it's not really a hot, very recent topic anymore. Um, I would guess um, it's something that has been around for a couple of years and a lot of very recent solutions. Um, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, there might be even nicer solutions now, but just um, trying to say that maybe some of you have already some idea about that topic. Still, um, semantic segmentation, what is this for anyone else? Um, it's the problem of classifying each and every pixel in an image that wasn't seen before. So your network would see this, would get this image with the, um, this, these bikers, and the task would be to um, say which of the pixels belong to the person, to the bicycle, or the background. And what you want is very accurate classification, right? So you want to you want it to be really good at seeing what is in the image, but you want the network also to be to be very good at um, seeing where the how the shape is and um, reconstructing the shape. So this mask actually, we look at it and we kind of can see that there's a bicycle in there because it's very precise spatially. And so this is what you would want with that type of uh, network. And um, yeah, this is what we used as a seg segnet, it's, its name. And it's one network that works really well. And we actually chose it because um, it's kind of lightweight. It doesn't have a lot of parameters as comparable um, solutions. And as you can see, it uh, consists of an encoder decoder um, architecture. So this is also a pattern that if you work with AI, you, you would have seen maybe before, but for anyone else who hasn't, the idea is that you have an encoder here in the beginning, which is something that you um, use, is a convolutional neural network that um, you could also use for classifying um, an image. And what it does, it has these convolutional layers, which are the, which are the blue ones. And um, yeah, it basically, um, goes through the image and um, searches for features that are descriptive of what is in the image. And as you go down towards that bottleneck, the narrow area there, the features get more abstract and more descriptive of the overall concept kind of, of what you're seeing there. And so in the end here in the, I mean, here in the bottleneck, what you have is the information of what you're seeing. But if you're working with segmentation, as I told you earlier, you don't only want to know what you're seeing, but also precisely where and how it's shaped. And so this is why you take that information and then you upscale it again. So this is what the decoder does. As, it, as the layers here become larger, the information is kind of spread back to the original positions. And, it's, um, and this is happening with a technique that is called max pooling upsampling. If you want to know more about that, I have an extra slide that we could talk about in the Q&A. Um, however, yeah, so this is kind of happening. It's projected back to its original position. And then in the end, you have a classification uh, output. This is a softmax layer. And for each pixel, it outputs um, the probability of the pixel belonging to the different classes. And then it takes the most probable class, and that's, that's your output there. In this, and then you get that, that map. Yeah, so uh, that was a bit quick. Um, so how do we now get from this, what we call 
a segmentation mask to um, the representation that we showed you earlier. So the incomplete point clouds and then the complete point cloud at the end. So first of all, a short note on point clouds. Um, some of you might have never worked with this before and it was also new to us before we started this project. So point clouds um, basically consist of points and each point um, usually has, is a vector of X, Y, and Z coordinates, right? So it's in 3D space. And they can also have additional information such as color, but in our case, we didn't deal with color. We just took this, um, these X, Y, and Z coordinates. And you can actually see a nice example, a GIF here of um, a point cloud rotating. And what is important about them as a representation is that they have some special properties. So first of all, um, they are unordered sets. Uh, if you imagine an image, a 2D image, right? And you would take all the pixels and just shuffle them the image would look completely different. It wouldn't, if you put it through a classifier, it wouldn't ha get you the same result. But with point clouds, you need to be able to shuffle all the points and still be able to get the same classification result. So no, ma no matter in which order I put this, these donut points into my classifier, I still wanted to predict a donut. Um, and then there's interaction among points, meaning that the points that are close to each other um, share some, yeah, some properties. So for instance, if you imagine you had a point cloud depicting a plane, then two points that would be on the wing of the plane close to each other would share more, would have more in common than one point on the wing and one point on the wheel of the plane, for instance. And then the third is the transformation invariant. So you can also see this nicely here on the GIF because um, since this thing is rotating, right? Sometimes it looks kind of odd, but we still want our network to be able to predict if the donut even when we just see it from the side. So no matter how we rotate the point cloud as a whole or how we translate it in space, it should still be uh, lead to the same prediction. Okay. And now um, I'll actually want to show you a small video that we did of one of the frames from our data set and how this frame as a whole, including color information looks like in the form of a point cloud. So um, as you can see here, I'll just go forward a little bit. So this is um, roughly where the camera would have been when it was taking this picture. Uh, and you can see that um, here's the tabletop, here's the, here are these objects that we're looking at that we're interested in. And here there's a bit of information missing. And the same as if I go back here actually, so right in front of the scissors, so the object that we might care about, there's some information missing because um, this part is occluded by this other box and right in front of it. And if I play this video a bit more, we can actually see it from the side and then we get a feeling for how much information is actually missing. So if you imagine you're a robot, you are missing basically, I don't know, three quarters of this bottle or, or of this box if you want, if you're trying to grab it. Um, yeah. And we're trying to predict this extra bit. So somehow changing slides is always a bit odd with video. Okay, so um, now how do we get from the segments to our initial point cloud representation, the incomplete one? Well, here, this is the output um, of the segment that uh, Angelia showed us, or showed us earlier. And we, in this case, care about the scissors, which can be seen here. And um, Basically, uh, down here we have the depth map, and we also care about the exact same pixels or the locations that we can see up here. So we would essentially just copy um, this mask, overlay it on there, and take the exact pixel locations, and then do some mathematical jiggery parkery and turn them into point clouds. And as you can see, this you, if, if you just saw this on the internet, you probably wouldn't even know that scissors. Um, the, the, these are the handles, and this part here is completely the sharp bit that you cut with is completely missing. And here, this bit is some noise, um, because as you can imagine, um, the network, the segmentation network is not perfect. So the output isn't perfect, so it might actually output some pixels here as scissors, which actually belong to the table or some other object. So that's why we see this as noise here. And then, comes the uh, really cool part, actually. Mm. 
the morphing and sampling network. So this is the network that's responsible for completing the point cloud. So um, this is actually uh, an adapted picture from the original paper by Liu et al. And they published this in uh, AAAI last year. And we were actually, I think, one of the first users of this network. So, um, right. So they took a car here and got rid of some of the uh, points, as you can see. And then they also put it through an encode and decoder architecture to get a complete representation that you could turn 360 degrees and it would have points everywhere. The special thing here is I'm just going to quickly mention that. And I also have an additional slide um, for that uh, for later in the Q&A if you want to know more about it. So the encoder here is different from the one that Anjali described. It's not um, a convolutional encoder, um, but it's based on PointNet. And uh, PointNet is from 2017, and it was the first architecture that actually enabled us to deal with point clouds without, um, yeah, in, in 3D space. And um, the magic that it does uh, basically kind of um, comes from it using stacks of MLPs. And each of these MLPs is used on all of the points so that we actually can uh, handle these properties of point clouds. Right? But if you want to know more, more about this, just ask me later, then it will probably get a bit clearer when, when I show you the architecture. So uh, we put this point cloud through the encoder get a general feature vector, which is 1,024 elements long. And then um, this is fed through the morphing-based decoder. And what does this decoder now do? So um, this is actually a really cool idea. So they take a, in two-dimensional space, they take a unit square, right? So this is represented as this thing here. And they sample multiple points from this unit square. And so let's, let's see, it's this point. So the two coordinates of this point, x and y, are appended to this general feature vector. And then afterwards, they put this whole vector through multiple MLPs. And what this, each of these MLPs essentially does is transforming this 2D plus general feature vector information into 3D space. And each of them is um, basically transforming it into one surface element, right? So, and you can see what the output actually looks like. I hope you can uh, see the um, colors, but here, for instance, uh, is one of these elements at the front where the um, uh, car window, front window would be. So this would be one surface element. Here at the back would be another surface element. Here at the front wheel. So yeah, that's uh, what it would look like in the end. And um, I've got another picture to actually show how this looked like while we were training, because this was quite a big aha moment once we, once we actually saw, saw this in action. So here at Epoch Zero, so at the start of training, here's somewhere in the middle, and here's at the end. So this is like a bleach cleanser bottle that we were trying to predict. And here you can actually see um, that what these MLPs do at the beginning, they're just randomly initialized. And they just take these sample points from this um, 2D square and just project them into 3D in some orientation and some translation somewhere in 3D space. And then as we train, these um, points are actually stretched out. So these surface elements are morphed, that's what, where the name comes from, um, into the final uh, 3D point cloud, the complete point cloud. And um, yeah, one additional note, maybe you can, you can see it a bit better on the previous slide. So the authors actually, um, so this is a um, uh, supervised task. So they had a ground truth that they were comparing this to. Um, and they also tried to make these surface elements, the points in the surface elements stick close together so that the point from the wheel wouldn't end up somewhere in the back here. And um, they do this with an expansion penalty which basically punishes the points for going too far away from each other. And why they do this is because um, they, wanna, um, they want to have the same density of points all across uh, the car here in this case. Because otherwise you could imagine that here, there may be a big hole while there's here quite a lot of points uh, in one place. And yeah, so that's one other thing that they did in their work. Right, um, and here, 
are actually some of the results. Um, so we used four objects from the YCB video data set. And the first one is the scissors, as we've seen before, the bleach cleanser bottle, a power drill, and a banana. So all fairly household objects that a robot might at some point in the future maybe interact with. And the pictures with A are always the incomplete point cloud. This are our completion results, so what the morphing and sampling network gave us as an output. And this is the ground truth. And as you can see, for the scissors and the um, power drill, this actually looks quite nice. They look very close to the ground truth. Maybe the holes are a bit larger, but it's actually nice results. And um, for these two objects, we got overall pretty decent results. Then for the bottle, um, which has quite a large occlusion here, um, the output looks a bit wonky. So uh, <laughs> there's like, I don't know, um, some bumps there where, they, where there shouldn't be any bumps, but you know, and the cat's kind of missing. And well, the banana looks like it should have been eaten like two weeks ago. <laughs> so um, I don't know. This is one of the actual good results. Um, so the banana, uh, in our case, even even though this is kind of counterintuitive because it seems to be the easiest object for a human, like it's, it's such an easy object, right? And the scissors seem so complex and somehow it didn't manage to get the banana right most of the time. Well, and because we uh, don't want to show you only the shiny results, but also some outtakes, um, we're going to show you what went wrong. So in the first row, you can again see the input point cloud the results and what they should have been. So for some reason in this case here from this banana, it made a perfectly looking pair of scissors. Same with the power drill, perfectly shaped scissors. I don't know. And here this blob <laughs> got turned to in, into another blob, <laughs> which is, um, yeah, you can see in high resolution, it's kind of a mix between scissors and banana, maybe. I don't know. This is a banana. And um, yeah, what we think happened there is um, maybe that was our hypothesis when we looked at these results. Maybe we actually made the task too easy for the network. Um, because what we did was before we gave the network the point cloud to complete, we actually brought it into a canonical position, meaning um, if, you look at, if you look at these scissors here, right, they are, um, this is the ground truth and it would be in this position. And imagine my scissors kind of look like this and are lying on the ground like that. And we would then transform the scissors to be in exactly the same position so that the network wouldn't have to do this turning around and translating it in, in space. Um, and then we thought, okay, maybe the network is just looking at the object and saying, ah, I think, I think you're, a, you're a scissors. And then it will just complete, uh, complete it into the, the perfectly looking scissor shape that it learned by heart. So that's what we think might be going on. But the important point here is as well that as most of us know, probably these things are black boxes, right? So we have no way of, or we had no way of knowing at this point why this was actually taking these decisions. And I just stumbled upon a paper two weeks ago, um, which was actually dealing with explainability methods. So trying to explain why a network does something for point clouds, which is the first of its kind, so to say, because usually I've only seen work done in this in like image classification, for instance. So it would actually be really interesting to use something like this and look into why, what it's doing there. Yeah, so uh, quickly drink something before I get into this part. Mm. <laughs> uh, this is me and I think some of um, my teammates during <laughs> um, the project. So there was actually four of us working on this. And we came across what I will call the science versus reality gap. Um, so one of our team members, Alexandra, uh, was actually trying out different segmentation networks before we committed to SegNet just to see um, whether any of them would perform better or, you know. Um, and she tried out Mask, Mask RCNN and a few different architectures. 
and uh, she wrote a meticulous guide of how to set this up and it included like install CUDA version 8 which is ancient to work with your GPU install Python 3. Point, I don't even know 5 maybe 3. Point, who knows um, set some sim links on your system and it was just horrible <laughs> we tried to actually replicate this because we thought what if her I don't know what if her system goes south um, basically we need to be able to still train the network and uh, I think one or two of us tried to set it up and we just couldn't so this is one of the things that really got to us that things were just not reproducible and not portable to other systems and um, yeah I think this is a uh, it's great that people open source their code. And it's, it's a really cool thing to have this in computer science and also with scientific repos, but it should also be in the sake of reproducibility, which is really important in science, right? Or should be um, to have code that's portable and that so you can actually reproduce your results and work on top of them. Um, and we try to do it better. I'm not sure we succeeded, <laughs> um, but what we did use was we actually uh, containerized our whole pipeline. So um, for those of you who haven't heard of um, Docker or don't know what a container is, um, it's basically, imagine you have a virtual machine. So a virtual machine is basically running a whole new OS on top of your OS, separate. Um, and Docker is basically a smaller, the smaller version of that um, running or sharing the Linux kernel of your host system, right? And you can use, um, Docker images, which are kind of the recipe for building Docker containers. So it's like a recipe for baking a cake. And you can share these images and recipes for building these images with other people. And so they can just replicate your whole setup very easily. Um, and we try to do this um, with all of our components. So we have three components in the system. We have the morphing and sampling network, the um, segmentation network, and um, a graphic user interface. And each of these two has, uh, or three of them actually have different um, dependencies, even different Python versions, different CUDA versions and so on. And they all are packaged neatly into these containers that run completely separate from your system, but you can still use um, the underlying host system GPU, for instance, during training, which is really cool. Um, yeah, and the third one is um, because we wanted to make it end to end, right? Uh, we actually built a um, backend and front end, uh, backend based on Flask and the front end on Vue.js so that the user could actually directly interact, uh, upload files from the YCB video data set, run the completion, and then display the files in the browser. And how does that look like? So the colors are, I love it. So the, oh, please load. Ah, here we go. So this is, this is our um, GUI. First of all, we have a little drop down where you can specify which object you want to complete, in this case, the power drill. Then in our repository that we, um, that we uploaded, we actually have some example inputs for each of the objects. So in this case, for the power drill, we have three files which all need to be uploaded. Um, this is the color image. I'll see that in a second. So this, is, this would be the frame. Um, the second one is the depth image and then some metadata that we need, like the camera internal parameters and so on. So, and then we open this, we submit the files. I've actually cut this, just a disclaimer because it actually takes a little bit of time. Um, and then once it's done, you can actually see these point clouds in action inside the browser. So this is done with uh, 3JS. Um, so you have an actually interactive port where you can rotate them, zoom in and out. And on the left-hand side, you see the partial point cloud from the frame. And this is the complete 360 degree point cloud with less points, mind you, but yeah. Okay. Let's change slides. Okay, right. So nearly at the end. So what should you hopefully take away from today? First of all, um, grasping, as we may have seen, is not trivial. It's very unconscious for us. Um, so we do it every day, all day, uh, since we were very small children. But nevertheless, this task is very complex 
for robots. So they have to think about so much different information. And what we did here uh, was actually just a very small part right at the beginning of this whole drafting task. So there's a lot of stuff that comes afterwards, like how you actually plan to move the joints of the robot and so on. Then second, um, point clouds. Point clouds are very cool, very powerful representations that you can work with in uh, 3D. And they do need um, slightly different neural network structures than, for instance, images. And third, um, this might be a bit mean, but this also goes towards myself. Um, science needs to sort its shitty repos out. That's really the case. I mean, it's not that everybody uh, produces shitty repos. That's certainly not the case. But from what we've seen um, during that project, there's really still room for improvement. For instance, writing readmes that are um, concise and really tell you what you need to do and so on, and also making it portable and reproducible for the next person that actually wants to use your code, because I guarantee you, if you do that, you'll get more GitHub stars. So, and that's it. Uh, thank you very much from Anjali and for me for joining our talk. And I've actually added a little reference um, slide here with all the papers that we reference. So for SegNet, Morphing and Tumbling, also PointNet, and this little robot that you saw before at the beginning then also the uh, links to the project where you can actually um, tr hopefully try it out yourself if it works. I really hope so. <laughs> and um, then for those of you who haven't tried out Docker but are kind of hyped to, to see what it can do for you in deep learning, I actually wrote a Medium article about this, which you can see here at the bottom. So um, yeah, hopefully we can post the slides as well at some point so you can just click on the link. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody's <laughs> clapping with the heart. <laughs> wow. Super cool. Boof. Uh, thank you for Any all the questions? references. Uh, I definitely read this, this Medium article, of course. Well, and everything. Oof. Uh, OK, OK. Time for questions. Um, uh, people, uh, you can write in the chat or maybe raise the hand. I already tried to take some of the questions in the chat. It's good to give some time. Yeah, we, we had um, some comments on um, how we could improve the um, results, right? So of course, um, um, Steffi already mentioned that the, um, the training data or that there were some issues in the output probably caused by the homogeneity of the training data or the network kind of um, learning some kind of classification problem where we're, we're like, it would be interesting to actually have a look into that black box. And um, yes, yeah, some others mentioned that more variant data and augmentation techniques could be step we could take to, to improve that. I like that um, point for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one, one maybe additional thing that we also um, need to mention is that this YCB video data set is video frames, right? So it's RGBD videos. And so uh, all of the test data as well is just from like a handful of videos, I think 10 or so. And so they are all very homogenous. So they're just basically someone taking this Kinect camera and going around a table like this. So you just, in each frame, you see a slightly different viewpoint of the same object. And hence, that also has to be taken with a grain of salt. Yeah, and also we focused on a proof of concept. Um, so this happened in a, in a, a project for a master's course. So uh, we had limited time. That's why we tried to focus on four different objects in the beginning to just get it right there. So um, next step would be more. So we had a question here, how much computing power was needed? Um, so to give you a sense, we um, trained it for these four objects on a um, NVIDIA RTX. Um, but yeah, this is the semantic segmentation part, which we used the Titan X on. I think we trained roughly a day, but we used way more um, data there. So this is on all objects. 
And then we only trained for the four objects on the um, morphing and sampling one, which we did on my laptop, <laughs> which has a, um, has a like a, this type gaming laptop with six GB. And that thing was burning. <laughs> and um, yeah, that took, uh, I, did, did I let it run for two days straight or something? But I, I always let it run overnight for many hours. And um, yeah, it was a strain. I bought a little um, a fan to cool it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was in summer as well. So that was August. So it was hot outside and hot inside. So <laughs> yeah. I'm curious about the uh, Washerstein distance. Uh, that, that's what you mean by earth movers distance, right? Exactly. Can you, can you tell us how you, can you tell us more about that? Like the approximation and whatnot? I'm quite curious on the technical stuff. Um, yeah, so I have to admit that I, um, I'm not, I'm probably not the person to ask for the mathematical details behind it. Um, so I have, well, yes, the earth, earth movers distance for everyone who, who doesn't know what it is. Um, it's also called Wasserstein distance. Um, and more amongst, uh, I guess, the maths community. Um, it's a measure that we used. Um, so it's it's a it's a formula that I didn't put here, but um, it's a formula that um, you can use to measure the distance between distributions or between point clouds. And it's um, you can derive it. That's why it's very nice to use in a network because you can use it as a loss function. We also used it as an evaluation metric here. And so what it does in words is basically it measures how much effort does it take to, um, to take one point cloud and make it equal to another point cloud. So you basically look at the distances between the points and look at the amount of points that you have to um, you have to move, but you're trying not to consider the individual identities, right? And so there, this is a very complex um, task to compute. And that's why usually you um, you approximate it, and uh, you try to make it parallelizable to um, to um, yeah make it run on a GPU um, faster. But um, for the specifics of the implementation, I, I have to point you to the paper or the repository um, because yeah I'm I'm not I'm not too familiar about the mathematical specifics there. Sorry about that. Yeah, so it's actually. Uh... Custom, custom implementation by the authors of the morphing and sampling network. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. I didn't, I didn't look into it that much, to be honest. <laughs> I was just happy that it didn't take as long as the usually would have taken with other implementations of EMDs because it's expensive. Um, would it help if, you know, on in addition to the point clouds, uh, each point, each point had a color associated to it? Would it, would that help? We thought about this actually, that uh, for this problem, it might have been a good idea to um, actually have the color information for it as well, because then the banana, or I don't know, then the power drill, which is red, would have never been classified as a um, banana, probably. <laughs> so, yeah, but this is, uh, we wanted to start as simple as possible, but that would have been nice to try out as well. Well, I mean, is it though simpler? Because if you think about it, babies, when they learn to grasp things like they also see, right? So they learn to grasp and see. Sure. They don't just see surfaces, right? So yeah, maybe the color learns to help to disentangle um, certain aspects of uh, yeah. Particular objects. So we had a, another more practical question regarding uh, where we can find um, AI or deep learning projects. Any ideas? So I personally uh, always like to look at Kaggle. So like some top ranked um, challenges there with notebooks. Yeah, someone already responded. So if you have ideas, maybe just type them in there with links. Any more questions or comments? I guess then thank you all very much for listening and uh, for your um, 
very um, good points and questions um, in the end. It was very nice, very nice experience. And um, yeah, hope to talk to you again. <laughs>